starting in chapter 5, verse 1 through 9. After these things, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem, by the sheep gate, a pool, which is, is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five pools. In these lay a multitude of those who were blind, lame, and withered, waiting for the moving of the waters. For an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool and stirred up the waters. Whoever then first, after stirring up of the waters, stepped in, was made well from whatever disease was which, with which he was afflicted. A man was there who had been ill for 38 years. Then Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been a long time in that condition. He said to him, Do you wish to be, get well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up. But when I am coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your pallet, and walk. Immediately the man became well, picked up his pallet, and began to walk. Now, it was the Sabbath on that day. Thank you, Matt. Leave your Bible open, if you will, to that, uh, that passage, and, and uh, we're going to keep reading in just a minute about what happens to this man. The, uh, the criticism that Jesus is under for doing a good thing, there were a lot of accusations leveled against Jesus, and a couple of times it was that he did certain things on the Sabbath. He healed, he taught, he, he fed hungry people. There were certain things he did on the Sabbath, and certainly that was the case. And this is one of those occasions where Jesus does a good thing and he is criticized for it. Have you ever done a good thing and been criticized for it? Sure you have. What's interesting is um, the, uh, the, the lives of broken people, and certainly you'll see these here at the porticos uh, around the pool of Bethesda, um, are represented here today. Um, people can get broken, can't they? They get worn out. They get tired. Not long ago in Nashville, Tennessee, some uh, newspaper wanted to interview couples or people that were broken hearted. And so they sent out emails to preachers in the Nashville area and said, will you turn in the names of people who you know have broken hearts and we're going to go find them and we'll interview them and we're going to do these series of articles on them. And one insightful, wise old preacher sent them the phone book, basically saying, there is, that's all of us. You know, you're talking about all, all of us in some way have had a broken heart. Some way we've been uh, mistreated. We've had some heartache in our life, and we have, been, we have been broken. I want to talk this morning about how God loves broken, broken people. You, know, you can be broken by circumstances, by um, physical, uh, especially we'll see one this morning, but the, the physical difficulties of life, spiritual, you know, heartache that uh, takes place in our life. Uh, brokenness comes in, in so many forms. You know, Jesus uh, actually announced that he came, one of the reasons he came to earth was to heal broken people. The Bible teaches in the Gospel of Luke, in Luke chapter 4, Jesus would stand, by the way, and read from the book of Isaiah in the synagogue. And when he read from Isaiah 61, it was this phrase that he had come to heal up or to bind up to free those who were brokenhearted. New American Standard says to free up or to heal those who are downtrodden. It is a word that describes someone who's had their bones crushed. It's someone who's, um, the pressures of life have just, uh, have been too much for them, and they, they feel the heartache of their life. Um, how does Jesus treat broken people? Now, many of you, young people, you've heard, some of us old people, we have this phrase, our dads taught it to us, and um, their dads taught it to them, and it's that um, God helps those who help themselves. Have you ever heard that phrase? Yeah. That's not in the Bible. You know, you know, the Lord helps those who help themselves, you know. As people say that, you know. Actually, Ben Franklin said that a long time ago in Poor Richard Almanac. What happens is Jesus, the Lord, he helps those who can't even help themselves. 
In fact, in the story that we're reading this morning in the Gospel of John in John chapter 5, this man had no way of helping himself. He had no way of getting any kind of help. The Bible tells for 38 years he has been in a sickness. There has been some difficulty in his life, and he can't help himself, and Jesus comes along. By the way, you'll see in this story, he doesn't, he doesn't even know who Jesus is. In fact, they keep asking him, who is it that did this? Who, who, who told you to carry your, your pallet? Who told you to, to walk, as we'll see in a few minutes? He's not really even sure who this is. He's just, he's just telling people what happened to him. So God helps those who can't even help themselves. He comes on the scene and he sees the brokenness in the lives of people and he helps put those broken pieces back together. There's an overarching truth that I think that, that needs to be said. It's a simple truth, um, actually two. One is people can be broken and secondly, God loves broken people. And that's what this story tells us, that people can be broken, and we know that in our own life. We know that in our family. We know that in the lives of others. People can find brokenness in their life, and that God can heal broken people. It doesn't matter where you go, by the way, whether it's Syracuse or Syria, whether it's Paris, France, or Paris, Texas, you will find broken people. They're broken spiritually and emotionally and physically, Proverbs 18, I love this question. The spirit of a man will sustain him in sickness, but who can bear a broken spirit? That's a great question. Who can bear a broken spirit? Here's, here's the problem. You can't always tell by looking at someone. Have you noticed that? You can't always tell by looking at someone. In fact, they could, they could be all dressed up and have awesome hair and be preaching. awesome tie. They could be going through a difficult, hard time. You can't tell by looking at people sometimes the brokenness and the hurt and the heartache in their, in their life. So right now in this room, there are people that are broken. There's no doubt about it to me. Uh, there are people that have been um, hammered, crushed by the circumstances of life. May, you can't see it, but they, they feel it. In fact, sometimes broken people cannot even express it. They know they're hurt, but they can't even tell other people exactly what's going on in their life because of the heartache that's, that's going on. So there are three ways, by the way, that this man was broken. I'll do them real fast. One is he was broken by the circumstances of life. The Bible says he was sick, he was ill. It's literally a word that means a, a debilitating uh, sickness or illness, um, it says that he's been sick for how many years? Do you see it? A lot of people say, well, he was 38 years old, and that's not true. He was sick for 38 years. We don't really know how old this person was. We know he's been sick for at least this long, but we don't really know how old he is or when he got this sickness, and, and, but we know for at least 38 years he has dealt with this sickness, and it is a sickness that causes him to be isolated, at least we know that he's infirmed in some way because he says he cannot get up and get into this pool when the water is stirred. He cannot move himself, so he is paralyzed in some way, or he is so weak that it takes other people to move him from place to place. He is, he is sick. Um, a guy by the name of Stanley Jones, who was a great missionary in India once told about a preacher who put together a series of 10 sermons and the, the series was entitled How to Avoid a Nervous Breakdown. And he said that by the time that man finished the series of sermons, he himself had a nervous breakdown. There's something about the circumstances of life that just wear on all of us and sometimes we, we cannot see it. He's broken by circumstances. He's broken by people. Um, there is uh, this place filled with sick people. Verse 3 says there is a multitude that's congregated there. You have to know that they didn't, in the, uh, you know, in ancient times, they didn't do as good a job. A lot of people think there's not a lot going on in our country doing this. But I got to tell you, if you get sick and go to a clinic, you get sick and go to a hospital, they're not going to ignore you. But... Here, when you got sick, you got put on the street. You couldn't go to a clinic or a hospital. You couldn't go get some kind of free 
treatment. You couldn't have people help you or assist you in any way. They put you on the street. They put you either by a gate. They put you on a porch. That's what happens here. Uh, porches were set up. Many porches were set up, and, and they would put you on a porch, and they would leave you somewhere so you could beg for money, try to get some kind of assistance, but in some way you were isolated from everybody else around you. Um, scholars believe that on a good day, just a, an average day, there were probably about 300 people around the pool of Bethesda. By the way, the pool still exists today. History says it was about two or three feet deep, probably had some uh, uh, underground uh, a spring at the time that maybe moved the water, some subterranean uh, kind of movement going on there, and I'll explain that in just a minute. But there, this pool still exists today. It was a real pool. It was by the gate, the sheep gate, which is probably a gate when people came into the city and they brought their sheep with them for a sacrifice. They would need to clean them before they presented them. And so the, the, the gate that was there by that pool was probably near a pool where they would clean these animals up and get them ready to present them for sacrifice. So this probably wasn't very clean water, to say the least. And can you imagine that during a feast, if 300 on a good day, that during a feast, notice my New American Standard says feast, yours might say Passover, literally the word probably is indicating that this is the second Passover uh, that Jesus would be a part of since his ministry begins. And if this is the second Passover, then that means there's not 300 people there, but probably 3,000 people there around this pool. Now, without being too graphic, can you smell it? Could you see it? A bunch of infirm people on top of each other looking for a handout that are sick, trying to get some. Can you imagine it in your mind's eye? Can you even imagine the smell, the stench of something like that? It's the idea that, that this would be someone who was one person of a whole lot of folks that, uh, that was broken by, by people. Um, your, your Bible, my, mine does this. Does your Bible show the, the, some of this in brackets? Does it show the water being stirred? Is that in brackets in your Bible? That's because some of the oldest manuscripts don't have that, the part about the angel stirring the water. What most scholars think is that a scribe kind of added that later on, trying to explain what the thinking of people uh, was at the time when they wanted to enter the water. So it was kind of a tradition, it was kind of a, a myth or a story that was passed down, and a scribe kind of added that to explain why people thought they needed to get in the water. They thought that maybe an angel was stirring the water, probably some underground uh, idea uh, uh, of the water being uh, moved in some way. Um, Bethesda, by the way, means mercy. It means a house of mercy. Uh, ironically, this is not a house of mercy. It looks like a house of misery when Jesus walks up on it with all of these infirmed, broken people there. And then the third thing is that he is broken by time. You let that sit, sit in for a minute. 38 years, some of you are 38 years old. Even if you're 68 years old, you have given the, probably the, the largest part of your life to a sickness. 38 years is a long time. Some of you have been sick that long, and you know what it feels like, especially when you've been sick that long. After 10 years of praying about something, you start losing hope. But then 20 years go by, and you're praying about something, and you start really losing hope. And then 30 years go by, and you've been praying about something. Now you're really losing hope. What I'm saying is that people say, oh, yeah, time heals all things. Not to, not to some people, they don't. Sometimes time wears us down, it's, it elongates because of an infirmity or what's going on in our life. I love, I love the honesty of the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians, by the way, when he says that he had suffered beyond the ability to endure and he had even despaired to life. He said, I have known hunger and thirst, I've go often gone without food, I've been cold and I've been naked, I've often gone, uh, I, I, besides everything else, he said, I face the daily pressure uh, of concern for all, all the churches. It is the circumstances, it is the people, it is broken by time. Now, a lot of people respond to brokenness. I'm not a psychologist. There are a few here, and they will tell you that people respond to brokenness in different ways. Sometimes they're, 
they're angry, sometimes they're depressed, sometimes there's substance abuse, sometimes there's antisocial behavior, sometimes they want to hurt themselves. You know, I, I cannot, e even today when I think of Robin Williams taking his life, I think, you know, how could someone so popular, so, so funny, so talented want to do that? This is a broken heart that a lot of people, even the people that were his closest friends, never saw, they never saw coming. So I, I want to show you how Jesus loves this, this man and how we can love other people. First of all, he, he loves them compassionately. He, he sees him. I love verse 6. Um, I'm going to read it to you again. This is, this is John 5 in, uh, in verse 6. And when Jesus saw him lying there, he knew that he had been, he had been uh, already uh, been there for a long time in that condition. Let, let me tell you the first thing to having any kind of compassion is you've got to see that person. Um, I told you several months ago I was at a restaurant and I was holding the door for these elderly people that were coming in, and it was taking them a really long time to get to the door. And one of them was on a walker, and one of them had a cane, and, and they, they, it just took them forever. And I wasn't, like, in a hurry or anything. Well, I wasn't going to close the door on them. And as I held the door, I said, welcome to wherever it was. You know, we eat at classy places. Welcome to Zaxby's. You know, welcome to Shane's. And... The, older, the elderly man looked up and he said, hey, thanks for noticing us. I kind of laughed at it, you know, just the way he said it was kind of funny. And then I thought, you know what, that's not funny. Thanks for noticing us. You know what he was saying is, he was saying what a lot of people that are hurt and firm say, that you get put on a shelf, you don't get noticed anymore. You're sick long enough and you get you get isolated and your friends stop inviting you to things and some of the things that you used to do you can't do anymore and you feel kind of distant from other people. You're just thanking people now for even noticing you. I, I love that Jesus, he saw everybody by the way, he didn't just see this man, but he sees all, whether it was 300 or 3,000, he sees all of them. The, the Bible tells us in the Gospel of Matthew that so many thousands of people came to Jesus and that he saw them, he looked upon them with compassion, and he saw them as sheep, like scattered without a shepherd. I love that. He saw everyone, but he saw this, he saw this person. I think one of the keys, if you want to begin to love broken people, is you've got to see them. And you've got to see them how God would see them. How do you see people? Are you embarrassed? Are they in, have they inconvenienced you by getting in your way? Just even the way we look at people sometimes and, and deal with people is interesting. Jesus, he, he noticed them, and he observed them compassionately. I love that. I love that about our, our Lord. Secondly, he, he interacted with them honestly. Jesus said, do you want to be made well? I've been making hospital visits now for 35 years. I've never asked someone that question. 35 years I've been going to hospitals, bedsides, hospice. I have never actually asked someone, hey, by the way, do you really want to get well? I pray for them to get well. I don't ask them, do you want, that almost seems like a cruel question, doesn't it? But the Bible says that Jesus saw that he had been in this condition. Did you notice that? Verse 6, he had been in this condition a long time. So it was a legitimate question for our Lord to ask, do you really want to get well? A guy named J.A. Finley says in those days in the Middle East, a man who had been healed would lose a substantial living, that he had been used to a system of being a beggar and laying around and collecting handouts from people. Jesus would ask him this question. He said for him to be healed means that he has to join a very hard workforce or labor force, working for pennies a day. Hard labor was ahead of him. And so he was a broken man, and Jesus asked him, do you want to be made well? Are you content with where you are or your condition? Do you want to really change your life? Do you really want a different life? Another commentator by the name of Frankerson said, so people would succumb to their illness bedding down with their alcoholism or their heart trouble or whatever paralysis they have. 
they become psychological and spiritual invalids retreating within themselves, avoiding responsibility, becoming more and more self-centered as they demand sympathy from others. So every now and then dealing with this kind of defeated person in my office or at the hospital bed or a luncheon appointment, I have actually asked them, do you want to be made well? That is a tough question. I know the Lord asked that, but it's a good question to ask. Do you really want to change or do you want to stay like you are? Some people have been like that for so long, they're comfortable being like that. In fact, that's how they identify themselves. Oh, I'm just a broken down old man. I'm just, I'm just this. They even call themselves that. They've named themselves that. Do you want to change is really a great, a, a great question. So he, he interacts with them honestly. By the way, later on, Jesus goes and finds this man, and he says, hey, listen, you've been made well, but make sure you don't sin. Uh, you, you need to live a life where nothing else worse will happen to you. That almost sounds scary, doesn't it? What could be worse than being sick for 38 years? I'll tell you what, be sick for 38 years and be lost and don't go to heaven. That would be worse. What would be sad is for us to feed hungry people and help them get to the hospital and, and pay for their rent and help them to buy a new car and never teach them about an unbroken gospel to broken people. That would be, that would be a tragedy. Jesus was honest with this man, and I love the way he deals with him. Do you want to get, well, hey, listen, you need to make sure in your life that you don't do some things that would cause you even, even greater hurt. And then the last thing is Jesus expected adversity. He expected adversity. The Bible says that immediately the man was made well and he took up his bed. That day, as Matt read this morning, it was the Sabbath. The Jews therefore said to him, who had been cured, it was the Sabbath, it's not lawful for you to carry your bed. And he answered them, he who made me well told me to take up my bed and walk. And then they asked him, who is this man that said to you, take up your bed and, and walk? They're hunting for him. By the way, they would continue to hunt for him. But the one who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn himself, a multitude being there in that place. Then Jesus finds him, by the way, in the temple and says, see, that you have made, uh, you've been made well, sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. So you'll notice verse thing, Jesus finds him. Why? Because he's withdrawn. They can't find Jesus because he has withdrawn himself. He was expecting adversity. By the way, it wasn't his time. It wasn't time to die. It wasn't time to go to the cross. It wasn't time to be arrested. It just wasn't his time. And so, so there would be adversity coming. I hate to say this. So I have a friend, and I love it, I have a friend that says that no good deed goes unpunished. I hate to say this, but sometimes when you help people, it, they'll be mad at you. You'll be misunderstood. You'll be criticized for helping people. I'm just telling you that. And one of the reasons is, is because it may be so strange to help people today that you will be misunderstood in helping them. Let me tell you something else, is the very people you're helping may be mad at you. There is this adage in the mental health community that says, hurt people hurt people. It's because people that have been hurt, they strike out at other people, and sometimes they project what's going on in their own life on other people. Sometimes the very people you're trying to help will end up bringing some kind of adversity in your life. Look up here a second at me. Don't quit doing good things. Don't quit being kind to people. Don't quit giving a, a, a kind word or doing a good deed for someone. Don't give up on that. It, listen, if that would have happened, I'd have stopped preaching years ago. If that would have happened, if, 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 if I didn't have that kind of mindset in my life, I couldn't have made it through the first year of ministry without helping people or visiting people or bringing somebody food, without some kind of kickback, without some kind of, 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 of hurt. That, that might come. That, but listen, I've survived it. It's, 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 it's okay. It's all right. But all I'm saying is that there sometimes there's adversity that comes when you, when you help people. And Jesus faced that adversity, probably not like, we'll never face it like he, they look to kill him. That's, you keep reading. They look to kill him because of that. By the way, I want to make one more observation and I'll close. This really kind of irritates me, but did you notice they don't say who, who made you well? 
They said, who made you pick up your pallet and walk? They were more upset about the Sabbath being disobeyed than they were actually a guy who had been sick for 38 years being made well. Listen, have y'all noticed this yet or not? Here's a guy who couldn't even get into a little pool of water and he's carrying his pallet around everywhere. Everywhere he goes, he's got a pallet now. He knows it's the Sabbath. He's been sick for 38 years. Wouldn't you want to tell people that? He's carrying his pallet around. I love what he says. I, I, I can see him carrying this pallet. He hadn't been able to hardly move an inch and he's carrying his pallet around. Well, who, who did that to you? Well, the guy... Whoever made me well, that's who told me to carry my pallet. I'm carrying my pallet because he said so. They were more upset he was carrying his pallet than he had been cured after 38 years. Sometimes we are so blind to the blessings of God, we think negatively. And we don't see the goodness that God has done in our life. So, God does love something that's broken. <laughs> In fact, the Bible says in Psalm 51 that a broken and contrite spirit, he's not going to despise. There are some things that God does like to see broken. An American artist noticed that a Japanese men, when they, many times they, they mend broken things. This is a picture of it. There's actually a word, and I forgot the word for it, but don't look it up right now. Don't Google it, okay? Do it later. But in the Japanese culture, when something that they believed was of value at one time is broken, they repair it with gold. And they take and they seal up the cracks. And this is an example of a broken, of a broken bowl that was sealed up with gold. A lot of times, if you go online, you can see pictures of vases that were put back together. They were valuable at one time. And because they were broken and put back together with gold, it even makes them more valuable than what they were. All I'm saying, y'all, is that we are valuable to God. Broken people are valuable to God, and he puts us back together. It, it is Jeremiah all over again, Jeremiah 18, where he goes down to the potter's house, and the potter is making a vessel, and it's broken, but instead of throwing the vessel away, it's remade in the potter's hand. That's our life. We're broken vessels and God remakes us and so he does like it y'all when we're broken not broken physically not broken spiritually not broken emotionally but when we humble ourselves and we realize that we're sinners that we cannot do this on our own we cannot get to heaven on our own we cannot live the Christian life on our own that all of us by the way are dependent upon the mercy and the grace of God so he does love it when we have a broken and contrite spirit. He will not despise it. In fact, what he'll do is he'll take the parts of our life that are broken and he will mend them and make them whole. He'll make us, uh, even though our sin has made us as chrism, he will make us as white as snow. We're going to sing, Bring Christ Your Broken Life. What a great song to sing at the end of a lesson like this. God, he loves broken people. He has to. He made so many of us. We're broken by physical things and emotional things and spiritual things. There's not one of us, I don't think, in here today, not one of us, that haven't been broken in some way. And that God has taken and brought us, mended us, made us whole. But boy, I would sure hate to say that you could be made whole emotionally and be made whole physically without telling you that the most important thing is to be made whole spiritually. That someone, after 38 years of being sick, was made well, but that there is still a, a greater concern that Jesus had for him, and it wasn't his physical health, it was his spiritual health. That something worse could happen to him. What worse could happen to someone who had been sick for 38 years except that they, that they die and they're lost? And so we have an opportunity that Jesus, he loves us. In fact, he, he, God sent his son so that those of us who are broken can come and be a part of his family, that we might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, willing to confess and willing to repent, willing to turn away from that sin in our life, to give our lives to him, to come to him humbly, contrite, with a humble spirit, that we will give our lives to him once and for all. You cannot, I cannot do this on my own, but he can in and through us, that you might be baptized into Christ and raised to walk in a brand new life. He will put those pieces back together in your life and he will make you whole 
In fact, he'll make you a vessel useful unto the master. Give your life to him today. I don't care how broken you feel you are. I believe the power of God can heal your life. Spiritually, he can heal your life. The ultimate healing that you will ever have in your life will come from him. Give your life to him. I'll be here at the front. An elder will be with me. If we can help you in any way, you come while we stand and sing. Bring Christ your broken life.